In the early 1920s, Chicago's Southside Ghetto became a vibrant hub for jazz music, dancing, and theater. It was where black entertainers thrived and shaped the landscape of black entertainment in the United States. At the same time, black-run gambling syndicates gained significant influence in the ghetto's economy and politics. While newspapers focused on the violent conflicts among white bootleggers, black individuals involved in policy gambling quietly established their own presence in the city's underground scene. Furthermore, by the early 1920s, Chicago's black community achieved a level of political control within the ghetto before other cities. These intertwined developments, the vibrant creativity of black entertainment, the rise of black gambling syndicates, and the growing influence of black politics, had a profound impact on the evolving ghetto. There were several key factors that contributed to the success of black individuals in gambling and entertainment in northern cities during the 1920s. Firstly, the rampant discrimination that black people faced when trying to find legitimate employment made illegal or unconventional paths more appealing. Interestingly, during this time, the worlds of gambling and popular entertainment were among the most racially integrated sectors in American cities. Secondly, black involvement in these industries was influenced by a long-standing culture of gambling, sports, and entertainment, particularly prevalent in the southern states. Black individuals in the early 20th century built upon the achievements of a few trailblazing black entertainers and gamblers who were active in both northern and southern cities during the 19th century. Lastly, the rise of black ghettos in American cities by the 1920s played a significant role. The influx of black residents provided a customer base for gamblers and entertainers, as well as a support base for local black political organizations, giving rise to opportunities for both economic and political advancement within the community. In the 1920s, black individuals came to dominate a type of lottery called policy gambling. In this game, bettors would wager their money on numbers they hoped would be chosen in a drawing of 12 numbers between 1 and 78. A common bet was called a gig, where three numbers were chosen. If those three numbers were among the 12 drawn, the better would win with odds of 100 to 1 or higher. Policy gambling was often seen as a game for the less affluent, as bets as low as a penny were accepted. And black people had a reputation for being enthusiastic players dating back to the Civil War era. Typically, policy gambling was organized by a syndicate. While the odds were in favor of the syndicate in the long run, there was always the risk that multiple bettors would choose the same winning numbers on a given day, which could bankrupt the game. To manage this risk, policy banks or backers emerged to take on the financial responsibility. Each banker would have around 100 or more policy sellers, also known as policy stations, located in neighborhood places like saloons, barbershops, or newspaper kiosks. The policy sellers would keep a fixed percentage, usually 20% of the bets, and send the rest to the banker. In larger syndicates, runners would collect the bets from the sellers and deliver the betting slips and money to the bank. After the drawing, the banker would gather the winning slips and return them to the sellers, along with the money to pay the winners. This system allowed policy sellers to earn a steady income without taking on economic risks. While the bankers assumed the risks in exchange for the potential profits from thousands of small bets, placed through many sellers. By 1900 in Chicago, each policy syndicate, also known as a policy wheel, held its own lottery drawings twice a day. During periods of lenient law enforcement, these drawings were sometimes open to the public and involved a blindfolded boy picking the 12 numbers from a wheel. The policy headquarters was a bustling center of activity. Runners would gather twice a day, Clerks and cashiers would diligently process the bets, and bettors would gather eagerly to watch the drawings. Even before black-controlled policy syndicates emerged, policy operators had a significant influence on local politics. Since syndicate backers had a vested interest in maintaining friendly relations with the police and judges, 
it was common for them to make payments to support politicians or even finance their own political careers. Additionally, a policy syndicate with numerous sellers who interacted with bettors daily became a powerful political force in its own right. It could sway voters and mobilize them during elections. Moreover, since many small neighborhood businesses like newspaper stands, barbershops, and saloons earned a steady income from selling policy slips, these legitimate businessmen often became allies in protecting policy gambling. In neighborhoods where policy gambling was popular, the policy backers wielded significant resources and formed connections with local political organizations. The history of black gambling and entertainment in Chicago between 1900 and 1940 can be divided into three stages, which closely aligned with the development of black politics in the city. In the first stage, which lasted until around 1915, black individuals had a limited but active role in Chicago politics. Due to the unique electoral system in Illinois, where a minority of voters in each senatorial district could elect a representative, there was a consistent presence of a black Republican in Springfield starting from 1882. However, blacks in the city were too few in numbers and spread out across different areas, preventing them from dominating local ward organizations. As a result, black individuals involved in gambling or entertainment, just like other blacks seeking favors from local politics, had to negotiate with white politicians for support and assistance. In the second stage, which lasted from 1915 to 1931, black individuals gained control over the Republican Party in Chicago's second and third wards on the South Side. This shift in politics was driven by two important factors, the rapid growth of the black population in the city and its concentration in a specific area known as the South Side Ghetto. Between 1910 and 1930, the black population in Chicago skyrocketed from 44,103 to 233,903. As the black population grew, they became heavily segregated and crowded into a ghetto that stretched for four and a half miles along State Street, from the south end of the Loop to 63rd Street. Because the city was divided into many small wards, black individuals were able to exert significant influence in the second and third wards. By 1915, they likely made up about half of the voters in the second ward, and by 1920, they constituted 75%. When ward boundaries were redrawn in 1921, blacks also gained dominance in the third ward. Despite being a minority in the city, black voters played a crucial role in electing William Hale, Big Bill Thompson, as mayor for three terms, from 1915 to 1923 and 1927 to 1931. Thompson, the son of a prominent realtor, had gained local fame as a water polo star, captain of the Chicago Athletic Club's football team, and an organizer of sports events. Republican Party leaders took notice of his popularity and, starting in 1900, when he was elected alderman from the second ward, Thompson cultivated relationships with black leaders. He attended their social functions and, as mayor, made efforts to fulfill his promises of providing city jobs and favors. Although Thompson was eventually seen as a corrupt and comical figure by reformers, his opponents' accusations of City Hall being Uncle Tom's Cabin or mocking him with the song Bye Bye Blackbird only endeared him more to voters in the Black Belt. Consequently, during the 1920s, black individuals established local political organizations aligned with the Thompson faction of the Republican Party, which supported and protected the growth of gambling and entertainment in the black wards. The third stage of black politics kicked off in 1931 when the Democrats gained lasting control over the city government. This happened just as the Great Depression hit, bringing widespread unemployment and suffering to the ghetto. Then, in 1933, Prohibition was repealed, which had a significant impact. These events posed a major challenge for the Republican politicians who had traditionally held sway in the Black Belt area, as well as for the gambling and entertainment businesses connected to them. In response, 
black politicians and policy gamblers face the difficult task of forming new political organizations aligned with the now dominant Democratic Party. It was a painful process of adapting to the changing political landscape and forging alliances with the Democrats who were now in power, 